Hey everyone, welcome to Reclamation Feast. My name is Sari Kamen. I am the Public Programs Director of MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink. Uh, we are so happy and um, excited to have you all joining us tonight. For those of you that don't know MOFAD, we're the Museum of Food and Drink. Like I mentioned, we were a physical museum in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, since the pandemic began, we have been doing everything online. We've been doing lots of virtual programs. Um, this is our third program now with the Green Space. They're just such a wonderful partner. And we're so excited to be doing this particular event with them as our third partnership. Um, we are just really, really honored to have uh, the chefs that we do this evening. This is a celebration of Indigenous food sovereignty. Um, it is a reclamation. It is a conversation about what Thanksgiving means from the perspective of the Indigenous folks that we have tonight. Um, it's going to be a really meaningful evening. There's going to be some cooking and some really great conversation as well. So we're very happy to be celebrating Thanksgiving um, in this particular spirit. So um, before I turn it over to introduce or have all of the panelists introduce themselves, I just want to mention that uh, if you want to participate in another program this week with us that celebrates more native foodways and food sovereignty. We are doing a screening tomorrow night of the film Gather, which is the fight to revitalize our native foodways. Um, and then we'll have a conversation following with the director of that film, Sanjay Rawal. So you can check that out at mofad.org. And then we have our next event with the green space. It's on the website, it's December 16th, and it is a Filipinx cooking demo and conversation. So it's very much in the holiday spirit. It's a, a Noche Buena, which is um, typically the Christmas Eve dinner in a Filipino community. So we hope you'll join us for that on December 16th. All right, so I am going to have all of the panelists introduce themselves tonight. So the first person that I can see is Crystal. So why don't you say hello, Crystal? Hello, everyone. My name is Chef Crystal Wapipa. I am the owner of Wapipa's Kitchen. I'm located here in Oakland, California. Thanks. And let's see, we have David and Rainbow from Sovereign Earthworks this evening. Hey everyone, my name is Rainbow, pronouns they, them. Thank you so much for having us here. Uh, we're, we're representing uh, Sovereign Earthworks. Yeah, howdy, I'm Rico, David Rico. Nice to see all y'all and have y'all tonight. Pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm Choctaw and Chickasaw on my mother's side and Mexican on my father's. Thank you. And we have Linda Black Elk, who I should also mention is actually part of the conversation following the Gather film screening tomorrow night. Awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Linda Black Elk. I'm an ethnobotanist at United Tribes Technical College in Bismarck, North Dakota. And I want to make sure to introduce my partner, my best friend, and the cameraman for tonight, my husband, Luke Black Elk. Um, he is from the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. And uh, yeah, we're super happy to be here tonight. Thank you. And nice to meet you both this evening. Um, and then I'm going to pass it off to Jennifer Brandt, who is our host this evening. And she's just done a wonderful job helping us put this event together. So thank you so much. Enjoy the evening and hope to see you all soon. Thank you so much for the great intro, Sari. Um, this is my second event with MOFAD. Uh, we had our first event this summer. Uh, so we're really excited now to be doing this, this uh, second event um, to celebrate Indigenous foodways. Uh, I think it's something that is becoming more well-known, but to this point, you know, we are still trying to build it. Um, I am Cree and my family is from the Daystar Reserve in Saskatchewan. So for me, this is a very personal event um, as well as just something that's, I think just really cool and exciting. So uh, without further ado, I think I'm just going to go ahead and let David and Rainbow uh, kick this off. I'll be here to host the entire time. I'll be asking questions. So um, yeah, just really excited to kind of get this going. And so David and Rainbow, I think we can uh, get you to take this away right now. So I'm going to go ahead and have you um, tell me a little bit about yourselves each. So if you want to start, David, and kind of um, give a little context as to who you are and, you know, sort of why we asked you here tonight. Hi everyone. Hi. Um, my name is Rainbow. Pronouns they them, like I'd mentioned. 
Um, just a quick uh, little bit of information about me. On my maternal side, I'm Soggy Bear Clan um, of the Eastern Band. Um, and on my paternal side, uh, Zapoteco Otomi. We're from a very small town called Kimichitenko, not even on the map. It's like a small settlement of indigenous folks in the Oaxacan Mountains, which is in Southern Mexico. Um, pretty much spent my whole life working on food sovereignty, kind of starting back in my uni days when I was at um, UBA, the University of Buenos Aires. And I did a project there working with the Quechua people in Northern Tucumán, um, helping to kind of build, you know, a farm there. And then really that kind of sparked my interest in, in this in indigenous food movement. And as I came back to the United States, um, really, really enjoyed um, connecting with other Native folks, connecting with folks who, who um, are really passionate about the food sovereignty movement. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, how do y'all, I'm, uh, I'm David Rico. Y'all can call me Rico, pronouns are he, him. So, halito, sahachifo ya liwi liko, chakta micha chikasha shia, apishna momoka atenkanomi. As I said, on um, my mother's side, I am Choctaw and Chickasaw, which are the original people, people of the South, um, around from like Appalachia's down through Louisiana. Um, and then on my father's side, my paternal side, I'm Mexican um, from the Northern area, like right around uh, Durango. And then today, this presentation, we are joined by another Sovereign Earthworks member. Their name's Justin. They're off camera and they're really like helping us elevate this to the next level. So awesome. you might see them. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Thank you for helping. So uh, one more thing, I think we can just maybe have, uh, just touch on quickly what you two do together with Sovereign Earthworks. Yeah, well, we'd like to kind of start our, our time with you by taking a moment of silence to kind of acknowledge the original people of the land that we're on, the Piscataway and the Pamunkey people. They're the original people of DC, Maryland, the area which we, we stand. And we also want to acknowledge the labor, forced labor of black African diasporic people who've had such a tremendous impact on the land which we are on. And so if we could just take like a, you know, just a quick moment to acknowledge them. Yeah, thank you. Um, but yeah, so Sovereign Earthworks, a little bit about us. We're, we're this amazing, small, but, you know, ferocious group of people in D.C. that are really committed to building a more accessible and equitable food system. We really focus on um, queer, gender expansive, trans, you know, two-spirited, gender, non-conforming folks of color here in the district. Um, we're really passionate about getting folks that are the most marginalized in our community get their voices uplifted. And kind of how we do that is um, through Heartseed, which is our farm. It's this amazing space that we've cultivated where we really only grow uh, Black, African, diasporic, Indigenous varieties. So you, we, we have three sisters, we have four sisters, we have so many amazing um, opportunities for folks in the community to kind of come and engage in their food system because food is so important. It's how we like begin and end our days with our families and our community. And that's really important to us. Mm -hmm. um, something we're working on right now that's really exciting for us is a zine. So we have a zine that's, that's about to drop like any day now. It's, it's at the printers, ready, fresh off the presses. Um, that really kind of talks a little bit more about the work that we want to do to dismantle, you know, white supremacist, capitalist, imperialist, cis heteronormative patriarchy in our community. And that's really who we are. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. All right, well, do you wanna dive into the food right now? We can just get started with your recipe. Maybe you wanna yeah. tell us a little bit about it and go, go ahead. Yeah, so howdy everyone, I'm David Rico. I spent many years in the kitchen and so I hope I can manage to not screw this up too royally. Um, let's hope that my time did not waste itself. First, before you start, you're going to want to preheat your ovens to 425. That's really important, you know, if you're going to be following along so that by the time we get to the actual putting the bread in, we, um, we have a warm oven ready and waiting for it. Um, so I'm a line cook, you know, you can throw anything on a fire and if that's how it's cooked, I can do it. 
Baker, not so much. But, you know, I have worked with bakers in the past. And one of the things that I've heard from a lot of bakers is to uh, mix your dry and your wet ingredients separately. So if you can see in this bowl, we're going to be doing a cornbread. You should have the recipe with you. We're slightly adjusting it so that it'll be vegan and gluten free. So this is our flour right here. And um, this is buckwheat flour. Yeah, so I, something that was um, really interesting is that when we talked about setting out these food boxes, it's really cool because there's so many different things you can substitute. So if you maybe want to talk about that a little bit, I know you're using certain ingredients with your recipe, but there's lots of different things you can use in place, correct? Oh, right. So like what I'm showing here, this should be the, um, the blue cornmeal that y'all will be getting in your packs. But um, you can honestly mix blue cornmeal with masa to also make this this kind of bread. Um, masa is a different type of cornmeal that's gone through a nixtamalization process so that it's chemically been altered by an alkalytic solution mm -hmm. so that the corn breaks down a little bit more. And um, those are like a lot of really big words to mean that it's like cooked in the opposite of an acidic solution so that the um, vitamin A and some other like really good things come out. And um, yeah, and the, the corn, the, the skin of the corn actually comes off as well through the next demolization process. So this right here, this is a uh, maple sugar. So maple sugar, maple is also like a really beautiful indigenous ingredient. It has so much flavor and it's healthier than just regular white sugar because it has like other things in it, other medicinal properties that um, have been like absent in white sugar, white flour, you know? And so if we're gonna make something, we're gonna make something for the family, we definitely want it to be healthy. We want it to support their bodies. Um, this right here is a little bit of salt and some baking powder. So the baking powder, it's, baking powder is actually technically, I'm pretty sure a type of salt. And when it interacts with a liquid, the liquid uh, causes the break the baking powder to break down further into a salt and then release some gas. So the release of like water and gas is the thing that actually makes your bread rise. You know, it gives it some body. Um, so these are all the dry ingredients that I have right here. If you look in the bowl, it's a really nice like, oh, it has a color to it. It's like very earthy. Yeah, it smells really earthy. It smells really nice. And so at this point, we're going to start getting our wet ingredients ready. And in case y'all are wondering, this is a special mixing device. It's called a stick. <laughs> you can find them in a lot of places. I'm telling you, they're like readily available. It's going to make your cooking process that much better. So get yourself a stick if you're trying to follow along. Hey, Rico, um, we had a quick question for you about the subs. Um, can you do buckwheat flour as a one-to-one -one sub for wheat flour? It depends on who you're asking. I'm using one-to-one. -one. Um, okay. It does make it a little bit thicker and it makes it a little bit earthier. Okay. So if this recipe comes out, you know, and you want to try it with buckwheat wheat flour, you know, I would try like mixing it at different ratios because um, you might not like that taste. You okay. know, for me, because this is cakey, because cornbread's really thick, um, because of all of these properties, I thought buckwheat flour would be appropriate, but there are so many different flour substitutes from tapioca to almond that like really, um, if you have any sort of dietary need, like I'm a hundred percent sure that there will be like a flour for you that is appropriate. Um, cool. but yes, it is different. It is different. Okay. Um, so right now what we're doing, like in order to impart more flavor of the corn, right? Like a really common trick for chefs to really amplify up a meal is to incorporate different parts of the same ingredient in different states. So what we're doing is we're including corn in the, in the cornmeal. We're including corn liquid. So, you know, bring your favorite canned corn to the table, take out the lid, put the lid in it, push down and you have your liquid, right? Mm -hmm. So now we're adding in our liquid, which should be about three quarters of a cup. So we're going to put in, this is a half cup for reference that I'm doing right now. We got about a half cup of corn liquid. This already has 
two tablespoons of oil in it, putting in the corn liquid for flavor. We're going to finish off the liquids with a little bit more water. Uh, and we have Taylor saying holla for cooking with sticks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the sticks add a level of authenticity that we really wanted to have. You know, it really, you can taste it in the end result. I promise you, that's not a lie. <laughs> it's a lie. You can't taste it. But, you know, it does add joy. And people say you can taste joy. So it's fun, right? <laughs> it's fun. I just like, I like sticks. I cook with sticks, um, especially because I grill a lot. This is the point of the process. This is important, and I've messed this up before. Add your, your, your nuts and your berries and your corn last. If you add it in at this point of the process, you will get confused. You will think they are lumps and they're actually just like really coated up bits of corn. And you don't want to smash the lumps because you like the corn. And then you just get stuck in this conundrum where your masa is really terrible. So, you know, the, the key to this, mix a little bit at a time. You know, you get these little lumps and you attack them with your stick or your fork or your hands you know you can use whatever you want yeah um, but if you roll up a little bit more too we can see it a little bit better that'd be great because you're i can see you're doing slowly adding the liquids so if you want to lift your bowl up a little bit more that'd be awesome can you see that in camera number two though um looking like we're just looking at you in that one so if you want to show the audience real quick okay i'm gonna get to the audience camera awesome. real quick awesome. Uh, it's hard to see, but you'll see there are some bigger clumps. I'm just incorporating them back into the dries, you know? That's what you're really doing. But so essentially, I'm going to just keep mixing this in little by little, little by little. Um, <laughs> it's not a hard process, but it is a process that takes time. And if you do not want to take your time, you probably, like, should cook something else. Because if you mess this up, then your masa will be ugly and you're going to run your holiday and your family won't talk to you and you're going to have to just like get married to find a new family and try it all again because you messed up your masa mixing the first time so patience fair warning patience is key so essentially what we're going to do after we mix up the rest of the liquids into this we're going to just like let it sit for probably about 10 minutes and do the fact that we're cooking live you know this is not something that i can really show you on camera but like it is a step that you should add to the cooking process in order to make it um you know just give it a little bit of time to to set up and get everything to do its space now i'm at the point i'm getting a little uh a little strap for time. I'm going against my own advice, y'all. They should never do that. When you say something, you should back it up. I have not. I know I'm a very shady character, but I know how to make cornbread, which is why you should listen to me in this particular instance. I'm using my hands. Hands are a really great gift. They have like five different independent movable digits. That's in fact four more than the stick. Um, <laughs> and essentially, we're just going to keep on going. We're looking for like a nice, a nice little dough to start forming. And it's going to, it's going to form quick. It's going to be really dry. And then all of a sudden, if you can see under the secondary camera, it's starting, it is starting to thicken up. It is no longer, oh, yeah. it's no longer corn meal. It is now like a liquid. We're adding the last bit of liquid in right here. We're gonna. Before we move on to the um, TV magic portion of this segment, we have another question from Gretchen who asks, yeah. is it okay to skip the nuts? We have nut allergies. Yeah, for sure. So here are the nuts and the cranberries. And I kind of just threw in handfuls. And I'm gonna throw in a handful of the corn too. Um, I'm like, I'm a handful cooker, you know? I think especially when it comes to flavor, you should add by the handful. Um, and at this point, I would just keep mixing all of this up in the bowl. Yeah. I've now incorporated the nuts and the fruit. Um, so black, black walnuts are actually an indigenous nut to North America. 
They are the things you see all over the road that looks like tennis balls. That's what we're cooking with here. Black walnuts, they have a fruity and an earthy taste, which should support the overall like project. And then we're adding cranberries. Cranberries were an important traditional ingredient for a lot of tribes from Maine to Appalachia. They would introduce it in pemmican at this stage. Okay, see, if you can see the moss that's in a ball, I would let it sit. I'd let it sit. Yeah. This is me. I'd let it sit for about 15, 20 minutes, go do something else. Here. Alex is asking about the cranberries. Do you chop them and are they dry or are they fresh? Your choice. Your <laughs> choice. These particular ones did not get chopped um, and they're dried. But at this point, you can add like cornbread, you can add whatever. You want to add, you know, you want to add fruit and make it savory, you know, you could do that. If you wanted to add jalapenos and other things and make it like, or sorry, if you wanted to add jalapenos and make it savory, you could do that. If you wanted to add fruit, make it sweet, you can do that. It's one of those things where it's like really up to you and what kind of thing that you want to curate. Maybe camera number two can come in here. Look, see, these are the little cute little vessels. If you don't want them to stick, Maybe put a little oil in there, just a hint, sunflower oil. Sunflowers are an indigenous ingredient. So if you want to continue that theme, this is not a pre-colonial recipe, but there are some really important, really neat pre-colonial ingredients in it. So from here, we take these two and we put them in the oven. So please follow me into the oven, 425 degrees super spicy oh my oh my and then we're with our oven mitts because we're really careful and we care about safety through the magic of tv <laughs> through the magic of tv we are about to discover what this will turn into so at the end after everything's done you know it'll come out something like this depending on what you what you put into it so it'll be like a blue cornbread it'll have nuts it'll have cranberries if you wanted to add other things you could have added anything that you really wanted to but it's going to be hearty it's going to be low in sugar it's going to have natural sugars it's going to have a lot of different things going for it a lot of different vitamins it's really hearty and you know this is just like a great little thing that you can cover with like a berry sauce Right. If you wanted to take the cranberries, add in maple sugar, reduce that down, make it more liquidy. Boom. You have a sauce to go over on top of it. You know, turn it into maple syrup. That's another sauce. You can use blueberries, strawberries, pecans, hickories. They're all great indigenous ways to like get in some really good nutrition. So thank you. I want to welcome back in Rainbow. <laughs> So a couple more things before we uh, we go on to the next one. So people, one, love your bowls. They think they're incredible. They're losing their minds over them. And do you need to bake with the lid? Is that a really important step as well? Um, I personally think baking with a lid pre preserves moisture. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So I, whenever, from anything from like lasagna to bread, if I want it to like retain its moisture, I'll leave the lid on. If you want it to have a nice like burn char or like quality like that to it, mm -hmm. then you cook it with the lid on. And then at the last point, you'll turn your oven up, broil, take the lid off and add some color. That's how they'll like, you know, add, add that. But yeah, cooking with the lid on, unless the directions tell you not to, yeah. if you don't do it, that's a great way to lose all of your water. and, and burn. Oh. Okay, well, thank you so much. We're going to have you stick around because we'll have a, a little session at the end with everybody. Thank you so much for all of your words and all of your intentions. Um, so, yeah, we will see you both very soon. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so thank you much. So much okay. <laughs> all right, so uh, for the next segment of this right now, we are going to be moving on to Linda Black Elk, um, who introduced herself a little bit earlier. Um, so very excited to have her cooking. She focuses a lot on how food is medicine. So we're really excited to kind of hear her perspective. Um, she has some really cool, you know, words to share with us. And so we're really excited to have her um, on. So if we can have her turn her camera on, that would be wonderful. 
Hi, everybody. Can you see me okay? Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we have, um, again, my partner, my husband on um, the other phone as well, and uh, the, the other camera as well. So I'm Linda Black Elk, and again, I'm so excited to be coming to you guys right here from our dining room of all places to cook. Um, but yeah, hopefully this will turn out okay. I'm not a chef, but I am so excited about food. Um, in our family, we really try to cook every day. We try to cook together as a family. And we also try to make sure um, to be really conscientious about the ingredients that we're using. We really like to um, eat medicinal food, like you were saying. So we think about like, okay, instead of just using, um, uh, like my friend uh, David was saying earlier, instead of using white refined sugar, why not use something like maple sugar that has so many amazing medicinal properties Properties. It's anti-inflammatory. It's full of zinc and potassium, um, all of that. So yeah, so we're going to be using a lot of really amazing medicinal foods today. So um, just before we get going, can you get your phone onto landscape mode so we have a better view of you as well? And absolutely. <laughs> when you're doing that, something that I wanted to point out that we talked about before. Yeah, we'll then work on that. Um, behind you, what is that behind you on the rack? Oh, <laughs> yeah. So um, we have a drying rack back here. Um, in our family, dried meat is really important. Um, it's a great way to preserve meat. It takes up such a small amount of space and it doesn't require refrigeration or freezing. So yeah, we have some drying buffalo meat and deer meat back there. Um, and we do that all the time throughout the year. Um, you can even dry fish, but all kinds of red meat dry really well. And I want to be clear, there's no salt, no smoke, nothing on that drying meat. It's just air dried meat. Um, and I mean, you can put things like salt on it, but you don't have to. Air dried meat is, has, you know, uh, people all over the world, indigenous people have been drying meat um, for thousands of years. So cool. very safe and a, um, awesome way to preserve food. <laughs> We're really into food preservation and traditional <laughs> methods of that. So, awesome. well, on that note, do you want to walk us through the ingredients that you're using today and then we can get going? Yeah, awesome. So we're making a wild rice and turkey dish. Um, everything that we're using in our dish is native, um, indigenous. Everything we're using in this dish is um, uh, traditional. Um, and it's also, you know, everything we're using has some type of medicinal or really nutritious value to it. And so I'll talk about that as well. So. Okay, <laughs> so in the in this cast iron pan, because we love to cook in cast iron, um, we already have some, this is actually turkey fat that's um, melted down. Um, we made a turkey, of course, yesterday, and we have a lot of turkey meat left over, and we love to scoop the fat off. Turkey fat is uh, actually a really good fat. It's a clean fat. It doesn't clog your arteries the way that maybe bacon grease does. And don't get me wrong, y'all, because I love me some bacon grease, but <laughs> that's not what we're using today. So, so this is some turkey fat. Um, earlier, I made a batch of this, and I actually used buffalo fat. So that's another good, clean, traditional fat that you can use. Um, but if you don't have access to either of those, you could certainly just use some olive oil if you wanted, or even butter. Yum. <laughs> is buffalo so, fat hard to come by, or is it easy to come by? Like, how do you how do you obtain it? Out here in the Dakotas, buffalo fat is probably shockingly easy to come by. <laughs> but we have a lot of friends who um, raise bison, uh, raise buffalo, or who, um, you know, uh, care for a buffalo herd. So um, when we get a buffalo, which we try to get one a year, like for instance, this dried meat won't actually be for our family. Um, we'll be using that um, in, we make food kits for elders um, during these, this, especially during this pandemic and during the sort of tougher winter months when it's more difficult for them to get out of their homes. And so we'll be handing dried meat out to our community. Um, and so we got a buffalo. We're drying a lot of the meat from that. Um, and then we also, of course, took some of that buffalo fat and we'll be doing a lot of really awesome traditional dishes with it this year. So, so pretty easy to get a hold of. So turkey fat, though, when you make a turkey, um, just scrape the fat off the top of those juices and put it in a jar and keep it. Um, it keeps really well. And like I said, it's a really good, clean fat. So to this turkey fat, um, I'm going to add some garlic. And now um, I think that 
we really underestimate the medicinal value of garlic. A lot of people don't think about it too much, but garlic is insanely antimicrobial. If any of you guys are homeschooling right now, which I know homeschooling is, um, you know, really happening a lot right now during the pandemic. But if you're homeschooling, you can actually do a fantastic project project with your kids in which you take um, petri dishes that are already filled with the gel, the auger. Um, you can take a Q-tip and have your kids scrape the inside of their mouth and swipe the petri dish and actually grow the disgusting things that are in our mouth in their petri dishes. <laughs> and there are directions that come with the petri dishes to tell you how to um, you know, grow those effectively. Um, but one thing that we do in our family to show our kids the antimicrobial properties of certain plants is we have them do that, you know, mouth swipe with the Q-tip. And then we actually take medicinal plants like garlic, like bee balm, like, you know, we have a lot of medicinal plants that we use. We put those in the Petri dishes and then we wait a day and watch to see which plants actually kill some of the bacteria and things like that that are growing in the dishes. So it's a really simple science project you can do with your kids at home. Um, but yeah, garlic is antimicrobial. It's also wonderful for your blood pressure. It helps to lower blood pressure. It helps to lower bad cholesterol. Um, it uh, also helps to stabilize blood sugar. So it's wonderful. Um, to our garlic, we're going to add some chopped onion. Uh, onion is another, you know, another one of those vegetables that you put into everything, but you really take for granted how amazingly medicinal it is. Um, you know, one of the things that a lot of people are using right now for that COVID chest congestion is an onion poultice. And that's just simply chopped onion put into a piece of cloth and placed on the chest. It really helps to break that stuff up. It helps to open up bronchial passages. Um, my friend, friend Ann Whitehat, who's a herbalist in um, Louisiana, she uses that uh, an onion poultice all the time right now for people who are COVID positive. Uh, and, you know, who knew that you could use something so delicious, <laughs> yeah. so medicinally, right? <laughs> right? There's more than one one use for things, right? That's really right. Well, we have someone, someone's asking um, about the bear root. Um, is so they ask, is your bear root OSHA legust? I am not pronouncing this correct at all. Legusticum porteri. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and it sure is. Can you see that? Okay. So this is OSHA, um, also known as bear root. In Lakota, we call it Mato Tapejuta, the bear's medicine. Um, and uh, it is in the same family as celery. So these two are actually very closely related. And Osha, or bear root, has a really insanely strong celery flavor, okay? So when you use this, you want to use very little. We took a little bit of this bear root and we ground it up with our mortar and pestle. Okay, into a powder. And um, because we're adding celery to this dish as well, we're going to only use just a small pinch of bear root in here. And um, bear root is actually really wonderful. Um, it's an amazing medicine that provides a lot of lung support. So it's great for, for the lungs to keep the lungs strong. It's wonderful for headaches, including migraines. Um, bear root is uh, great to open up breathing passages, you know, those airways in, in our lungs. Um, it's also very, very healthy. Um, it's, you know, full of nutrients, vitamins and minerals. Um, yeah, it's just a wonderful plant. But let me really be clear here. I ask you guys to be very cautious when you um, get bear root, especially if you're purchasing it. Make sure you purchase bear root. OSHA from a really reputable person or vendor that you know is harvesting it sustainably. Um, OSHA is, it's, it's very easy to over harvest. Um, and we need to make sure that indigenous people have as much access to OSHA to bear root as, as possible. Um, so if you are not indigenous, um, you know, maybe go with something else. Uh, we're also using rosemary and I, I, I I won't be adding this till later, but rosemary is also great lung support and it's antimicrobial, you know? So there's lots of options if you can't get a hold of bear root from uh, a reputable, reputable vendor. Okay, so now I'm gonna add my chopped carrot. Okay. Um, which is a really great source. You know, it's kind of sweet. 
Um, it's a source of complex carbohydrate, not simple carbohydrate. So it doesn't raise your blood sugar. Carrots are low glycemic index. And it's actually true that carrots are very high in beta carotene, which is really good for eye health. You know, I, I mean, you know, we were always told that when we were little. And I think the, the myth that, you know, carrots are so great from your eyes, there, there is a certain mythology around that. But it's true, um, those levels of beta carotene are actually really good, um, really good for uh, preventing uh, damage to your eyes. So carrots are medicine. <laughs> and we're also going to add some chopped celery to, to our dish. So and another celery question, sorry, I was going to say no, another no, question about the bare root. Is that dried and then you do the mortar and pestle? Okay. Yep. I see. Uh, we're using dried bare root. Bare root does not grow here in the Dakotas. It actually, um, unless you cultivate it, it will only grow what in the wild above a certain elevation. I think it's 6,000 feet or so. Um, so when we get ours, we harvest it sustainably as a ceremony, um, our family out, uh, out west in the mountains. So, cool. okay. Okay. So I have my vegetable sauteing here and, um, let's see, I am going to go ahead and add my rosemary at this point, I'm trying to make sure to follow the recipe for you all, because <laughs> I do not follow recipes at home, like yeah. ever, <laughs> you know, it's, it's really like what we have. Um, but we, we actually make a variation of this dish all the time um, because we eat a lot of wild rice in our home. Oh my gosh, adding that rosemary in there, it's so beautiful. Rosemary, like I was saying, is actually a wonderful medicine. You can burn rosemary, sort of like indigenous people burn sage. You can actually burn rosemary and that smoke is as antimicrobial as the smoke from Artemisia species, um, sage. Uh, rosemary is also great for your um, for gut health. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's wonderful, you know, it, especially if you're pr someone who's prone to ulcers. It's wonderful. Um, so, okay, garlic, carrots. Oh, and I want to make sure to add my nettles in here, my stinging nettles. Okay. Right. So I want to show you guys this. This is stinging nettles um, that I have actually soaked in some hot water. I basically made nettle tea and I won't throw this soaking liquid away. I'll actually drink it as a tea because that's wonderful medicinal tea there. But um, I, I soaked these nettles for probably about 15 minutes to reconstitute them and make them soft. And I'm just gonna add them right in here. Nettles are so anti-inflammatory. Um, if you know someone who's prone to arthritis, if you know someone who's prone to um, even inflammation caused by allergies um, or, or inflammation caused by sinus issues, nettles are a fantastic vegetables to, to start incorporating into your diet. And um, these were nettles, some really beautiful young nettles that I harvested this spring. And um, you can see they just go great in here. They have a wonderful um, savory flavor to them. So they're, they're great to have, have so, in here. So real quick, say that the nettles, um, if people got the box, that would have been in the box, which is a fantastic addition, I think, because it's not necessarily, I mean, super easy to come by or harvest nettles. So I think it's a great thing to include. Um, we also do just want to, uh, call out the intertribal agricultural council that sent the boxes out. So oh, yeah. folks who may have not gotten their boxes today. We can blame this on the uh, United States Postal System and you can check with MoFat again about when to get your box. Um, I do want to sort of, we're going to be wrapping up relatively soon. So I have one more question for you before we get to the uh, TV magic portion <laughs> of this segment. And I see you adding in all these wonderful vegetables. You did use the turkey fat, but is there any way to make this um, a vegan or vegetarian without with keeping it traditional? Totally. Um, so sunflower oil is actually very traditional. Um, a lot of times uh, tribes, including the Mandan, um, which I want to say also, I forgot to say that I am actually on the traditional homelands of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara peoples, and also the Ocheti Shakoin. So this is a traditional dish to make for here as well. But um, if, you, uh, if you are vegan or vegetarian and you don't want to use animal fat, use some sunflower oil. Um, they would traditionally grind those up boil them and use the fat, the oil that would float to the top. Um, so use some sunflower oil instead. Um, also, you know, obviously you do not have to add turkey uh, to this meal. The mushrooms in our, I just added some uh, chopped 
cremini mushrooms in this case, but shiitakes or, you know, whatever other mushrooms you have access to. Mushrooms are super high in antioxidants. Uh, they're anti-cancer. They're, they're wonderful um, to add to your food, but they, you know, they add a really nice meaty uh, texture to, to this dish as well. So I wanted to say that I added the mushrooms in here and I'm just gonna go ahead and quickly add my turkey, my chopped turkey. Um, you can use leftover turkey, or this is a great reason. This dish is actually a fantastic reason to make turkey. Um, <laughs> and I'm gonna add my beautiful wild rice that I cooked up earlier. I actually used chicken broth in this um, as well, uh, but um, you don't have to. You can just you know, make wild rice with, with water. Um, and wild rice, of course, is so medicinal. And I wanna say quickly, that if you are um, going to get wild rice, I think some came in your boxes, um, thanks to the indigenous um, intertribal ag council, um, but uh, make sure that you're sourcing from indigenous people. If you wanna know how you can support indigenous people, make sure that you are going to indigenous chefs, indigenous farmers, indigenous gardeners, indigenous foragers, um, who are who are gathering all of these amazing foods and supporting their communities with them. So please make sure that you are going to indigenous people when you are getting um, these products. And I wanna say that this wild rice was actually harvested by us from a canoe um, this past fall. Um, so, you know, it's, it's there's a lot of uh, good spirit medicine and joy, um, as my friend David was saying earlier, that goes into this food. So um, here I am. I wanted to also say that you can actually do all kinds, we do all kinds of variations on the, this dish. Sometimes for a little crunch, we'll add pinions or pumpkin seeds, pepitas. Um, we'll add dried cranberries, which are fantastic in here. And especially if you are going vegan, adding in some beautiful pepitas or pinions and cranberries will add a lot of uh, protein and nutrients to your dish as well. So like this isn't even, hasn't even been cooking on here long, but check this, check, I was gonna cuss there. I'm so glad I didn't curse. <laughs> Oh my gosh, check this stuff out, <laughs> y'all. <laughs> um, doesn't that look amazing? I, I, I don't know. It's one of our favorites anyway. Really good. Um, <laughs> yes, you're just about finished. So we have a few more things to add in. Um, it's a big portion. Salt and pepper. Yeah. It's, it's like a nice big portion for a family too, which is really nice. It looks like it can, yes. it's really adjustable. Um, if someone asked if you can use ginger instead of the bear root. Absolutely. And you could use parsley instead of bare root. Um, the ginger would be great in here, um, especially if you wanted to add, you know, you, you could actually add some water chestnuts for crunch in here and ginger, and that would give it a really cool twist. Um, I have a friend who puts curry powder in her wild rice turkey dish, you know, and it's fantastic. Um, but but remember that bare root is in the celery family. So you don't have, you know, you could just take it out. You could add some parsley in there or any other member member of that celery family that, that you might have in your pantry. So um, can I show you guys kitchen magic? Is that yes, you can. <laughs> awesome? So we obviously um, made this earlier and we actually did put um, some cranberries and pepitas in there. And, uh, you know, I have a five-year-old, a 17-year-old and a 19-year-old. And this is like one of their favorite things. You can actually have this for breakfast, put a fried egg over the top like a runny egg, oh my God. Um, yeah, it's wonderful, so. Great, well, I just wanna say thank you. And I mean, it was great to see you kind of cook along with everything and really <laughs> cool to see all the substitutions you can make with that as well. So we really appreciate that. And then again, we'll have you stay on and we'll talk again in a little while after Crystal. So thanks again, it looks so wonderful. I can like, almost smell it. <laughs> oh, it's so good. <laughs> all right, see you guys in a bit. See you soon, thank you. So our next panelist is going to be Crystal Lapape. And we're so excited for this because I think this just looks like such a, a great recipe um, using so many indigenous and forage products. So Crystal, we're so excited to have you on. You have such amazing energy and we can't wait to see you cook. Oh, thank you. Can you guys hear me good? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Oh, okay. Just checking. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. I just want to introduce myself really quick. My name is Chef Crystal Wabipa. I am the owner of Wabipa's Kitchen located here in Oakland, California. 
I love being an indigenous chef. Um, you can call it indigenous, Native American, whatever you want to call it. I love it. Um, just for one, I've been um, always um, wondered at young very age. Sorry to interrupt you, but do you have um, the other camera on too right now? We want to see everyone, every every angle. <laughs> oh, oh. It says I'm waiting for someone to let me in soon. Okay, okay. So knock knock. <laughs> Here's a, here's our uh, TV magic right now. Um, behind the scenes look at how it all goes. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you have um, DIY. <laughs> Perfect. No, it's okay. Good. Are we good? Yep. Okay. Thanks. Now, where was I? Oh, <laughs> uh, I just want to express my love for Native American foods um, at a very young age. I always wondered why here in the Bay Area, we never had a Native American restaurant. Um, it's just something that struck me. And one day I decided I wanted to do it. And when it comes to that is um, a lot of knowledge, a lot of protocol. What I mean by that is a lot of Things I was very unaware of. Why? Because we don't have so many of our foods. We It's not in the mainstream of the culinary scene, I might add. And so um, it has a lot to do, I just want to say, from historical trauma, colonization. It has a lot to do with that. Um, how I see Native American foods is what you see on my plate. This is my my vision, how I see, because I see it as being just beautiful. All of the foods are so beautiful. Um, I'm pretty much well known as a lot of berries. And so with the ingredients box that everybody is getting at home, um, I was like, wow, this is pretty cool because I do use this pure maple sugar. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's in our menus and also um, the blue corn, it's also in our menus. And I was just listening to my sister Linda talk about um, food sovereignty. And it's such a must for my business to um, incorporate all these indigenous other business of these products inside of my foods. You know what, Linda, you're going to be really excited to hear that Hillary says she is eating your choke cherry bar right now while watching. <laughs> oh, 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 thank you. Thank you. And um, see, just for example, with the choke cherry bar, you're, um, it's supporting so many other indigenous businesses. And I that's the love that I have. Um, so when you see my foods, this is what I... I vision, I have like this huge, huge vision for native foods and how I want people to see it because it's not really recognized so much here in the Bay Area. Yes, um, we have other chefs that's going on, but I've been also doing this. I've been on this long road for about 12 years. I've been um, learning about these foods for over 35 years. And this is something that is my heart and my passion. So I love to create as indigenous chef. I love to get all these beautiful ingredients, the same ingredients that Linda was talking about, the same ingredients that David was talking about. I just love to, it's like, um, to me, it's like paint and it's my art. And I just love to present it in a good way and actually have people taste. So what I'm creating um, from the bundle that everyone has at home, this is a fun one, okay? This is something that I do with my children. This is something where I like to introduce um, uh, the blue corn. This is something I like to introduce the maple sugar. And so what we're doing is a berry blue corn upside down cake. A what? Yes, a berry blue corn upside down cake. So. I kind of, um, when I did this menu and actually for this recipe for you guys at home, I was also like, we're taught, I'm always trying to be health conscious of what we're adding into our foods and sometimes we can replace it. So as I'm making this, feel free to ask questions, okay? So let's have some fun. So as we're gonna mix the dry ingredients, we're gonna have one and a quarter cup of blue corn. This is something that's my favorite because of the color, one, two, because of the texture. If you, when you at home, you can feel the texture and you feel like it's like a little coarse, that's a good thing because you can, well, I like food science too. <laughs> that's a good thing because you can um, actually have really good fun with it and you can actually control it. Sometimes if it's really, really fine and it does its own thing and it has its own mind. But with this one, I love working with it. I've been working with it for years. 
So I'm going to add all my dry ingredients actually into this little bowl right here because it's one and a quarter. And then I have salt. Yeah, I just put a little um, teaspoon of salt. going to add that in there and also with the bacon powder. Then we're gonna, just going to go ahead and mix all of these dry ingredients. Um, I have my other camera going on over here. So I'm just going to stir just to kind of incorporate and mix it all together. And then from there, we're going to add our wet ingredients. Now, to me, this is the fun part, okay? As for the fun part, so we're going to have our coconut milk. The reason why I have the coconut milk um, and the reason why if you're looking at the recipe and you're saying to yourself, why is there no water? That's because we have a lot of water in this coconut milk. Also, we have a lot of water in our squash. I love squash. Squash is also just like the blue corn. It's something that you can be creative with. You can do different things and also it's healthy for you. So I'm gonna put that in there. I'm just gonna add the cup of squash. And then from there, so the difference between um, the regular sugar and the maple sugar. The maple sugar right here, it's more sifted really thinly. And so it's like, a, um, mm, I'm gonna say, the texture is almost like a baking powder. And so that's the good part because it also turns into water once we add into it, okay? I just wanna let, let people know what's the difference. So when you have, you can also substitute, if you like white sugar, that's fine. But if you like brown sugar, that's fine also. But when it comes down, I want, to, I want you to, I'm gonna show you. See how it's melting? You see how it's all melting in there? So that's the difference on that. And then I'm gonna add one egg. Normally I use like a duck egg, but we're gonna use regular eggs. It all kind of depends on people. So I'm just gonna throw one egg in there. And then from there- a Duck egg and a regular egg. Yeah, the difference is it's because me personally, I like the yolk of a um, duck egg and then just the regular egg because the regular eggs are per, pretty much, it all kind of depends if you get the brown eggs, you know, but I like using the duck egg. Me personally. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is you see how I have the cup of squash and what I did on um, beforehand with the squash, I had cut the squash and I had diced it. And then I just want to go ahead and just steam it or you can bake it. Um, it. It all depends on the person that what they're doing. But me personally, since I'm adding it into the cake, I just want to go ahead and just steam it for about 15 minutes. So what I'm doing right here is I'm just gonna smash it with the egg because it's really soft, but I like the chunks as we're getting the chunks in there, okay? You see what I'm doing right there? See, you don't even see the sugar anymore. You don't even see the eggs. We just get all that all mushed up in there. And then from there, then the recipe does call for some coconut oil. I just want to put half of the coconut oil into the batter, okay? Just half. Because the other half, what we're going to do is put it in for the pan. And that's what we're going to go ahead and fold the berries on, okay? So at the same time as I'm mixing that, and then we have our cornmeal, then we have our baking powder and our salt, we're just going to add slow and mix in there. Okay. If you have a mixer, that's great if you want to do it by hand. But this recipe right here is really good. Um, you can just do it by hand. You don't have to like put out your KitchenAid, things like that, you know? And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fold it in with the whisk. And you're going to see these chunks yep. of the butternut, which I like. And you see how the batter is? It's not too thin, not too thick. And this is exactly what we're looking for, okay? And I'm just chopping in the butternut squash all up in there. And to me, I think it's so pretty. So we have a couple questions about substitutions that I kind of want to yeah. throw at you while we're going. Um, can we do yellow instead of blue cornmeal? Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's yes. One one. yes. Um, someone's also asking can, for vegan recipes. Can you do flax for the vegans instead of egg? Yes, you can. Yes. I highly recommend that one. Yes. Good one. <laughs> and then I think we have one more good one. Um, do you grease the pan and does it have to be round? 
No, it doesn't have to be round. Um, me personally, if we're gonna do an upside down cake, I like it round, but you don't have to. You can actually have a square, as long as it can bake. <laughs> That's the main thing. You know what? You can even try cupcakes. Um, we also do a cupcake one. So you try with the cupcake. Okay, and, and do you bring with the pan as well? Yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> exactly. So as this blue corn, um, it's thickening up. Okay, so with the blue corn, it is, remember, it, the cornmeal and the flour, there's two different things. And then with this blue corn, it's thickening up. So I have a really thick batter. You see? Isn't that gorgeous? Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. See how it starts off, it starts off really thin. So I just don't want people to panic and say, oh, it's kind of a little thin. But the more you let it sit, the more thicker it will be. So we're just going to let that set just for a minute. I'm going to put this onto the side here. So I have a pan. <laughs> and so with the rest of the um, coconut oil, I'm going to add into the pan. And what I'm going to do is kind of whoosh it around. Oh, sorry. I forgot. I'm going to add in the vanilla <laughs> into the um, blue corn. But at the same time, I'm kind of just swirling this around, if you can see. And you can use other kinds of oils if there's like oh, a coconut yeah, you can use a spray. You can actually use a spray, but um, or even like some people want to use butter and stuff. Yeah. But actually, you got to keep to the same. If you can kind of keep to the same ingredients on the coconut oil, there's a reason why. Because we're going to add the berries. And we, want the we don't want the berries to stick to the pan. Or either you can go ahead and use wax paper if you want to. But we're shooting for an upside down cake. Okay? So what I'm doing is I have some blueberries. It all kind of depends on your berries. Me personally, I love blackberries. I love blueberries. I love huckleberries. I love all kind of berries, okay? But this one right here is going to be more of a dark version because we are in the holidays. And if you like Thanksgiving, if you want to present something awesome, I eat with my eyes. I see color when it comes to indigenous foods. And for me, blue corn, blueberries, blackberries is a perfect match along with the squash. Okay. <laughs> uh, so speaking of the squash, someone is asking, can you do it with raw squash? Um, Mm, you could do it with raw squash, but I would recommend just to kind of steam it just for a little bit so it can soften up because it all kind of depends how long we're going to bake our cake, which we're going to shoot for 30 minutes to 30, 35 minutes. The reason why is because we don't have no flour that's going on in our upside down cake. Right. Okay. And this is straight cornmeal. So you're just going to bake this just as you would do cornbread or corn muffins. Okay. So what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to get my blueberries and the recipe does call for two cups. This is one cup of the blueberries. And you see how I got this around here. You could either layer it if you want to, but me personally, I like just to cover at the bottom of it. And then we have our blackberries. Okay. And you can do any kind of berries you want to. Can you do frozen berries? Um, yes, you could. You could do frozen berries too. And then what we're going to do with our squash and our blue corn, you see how pretty that is? And our maple, all the goodies are in there. We're going to add it to the pan. And as we're adding it to the pan, you see how I got this? So we're just going to swirl it around. It doesn't take a long, big swirl. Just swirl it around just to coat it all, okay? And then from there, I'm gonna put it into the oven. We're gonna bake this for 30 minutes, just enough for it to brown on top, okay? It doesn't take very long just on this recipe, but if you have more people or you wanna double it, um, go ahead and bake it for like 50 minutes if you wanna double the recipe, okay? But this one right here only requires 30, okay? And then like we said, the wonderful magic of virtual. <laughs> So, voila. <laughs> wow. So what I did, <laughs> it, it, when, you, when you turn it around and dump it, it comes out really great, right? Yes, it's a lot of berries. Yes, it's ooey and gooey, but actually it's very, very delicious. <laughs> 
Uh, what I'm going to do right here, I don't know if you guys can get a good view. Can you get a good view of that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to add just a little bit more stuff onto it. So because we actually are going to have this tonight. <laughs> we, do not waste. we do not waste. Okay. So what I did with the with the rest of the berries that I had, I actually pureed it. I cooked it down in a little bit blue corn. I'm just going to add this on there just because one, my kids love when it comes to the berries. Mm -hmm. But this right here is the blue corn berry upside down cake. And what we're going to do is just kind of, I'm just going to like swave it on there. See how I got it? Just like oh. that. That color is amazing. Yeah, I love the um, the berry colors on there. You don't have to do this if you don't want to. You can just leave it just like that with the squash. And then from there, what I have is just some little squash blossoms. I'm just going to add on top. You can have so much fun with um, when it comes to indigenous ingredients. I I find it so um, a therapeutic. I find it so. <laughs> beautiful and I think of my ancestors and I think of my grandmother, my great grandmother of all these ingredients because I would not be a chef without these people and also without the elders that I've been really fortunate to learn how to cook from. And this is something that I would like to share with everybody. Of course, this is a blue corn berry upside down cake top with the little squash blossoms. You can add, for instance, you can add if you have um, pumpkin seeds, or if you like nuts, you can add anything on there and then you can just serve it nice and warm. But the whole purpose of this cake is just to recognize, of course, blue corn meal. <laughs> well, it looks like you probably add a little extra of the maple sugar on top as well. If you want to look at it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good yeah. one right there. Yeah. <laughs> Put it up there and spook it on there and then everybody yeah. can take a spoonful. And so yeah. this something very enjoyable for the holidays to enjoy. And then also we're celebrating Native American Heritage Month. And so that's something else um, of us celebrating, especially with Native food sovereignty, um, that's celebrating things that um, we don't never really get that often to share and people doesn't recognize. And this is the month. I like at the end of the day, I want people to recognize about food sovereignty. I mm -hmm. want them to realize there are indigenous chefs here and very, very talented. And we are in the forefront of being recognized as a chef and as a business owner, as um, people that were so involved in our community, our community comes number one. And the other, how beautiful our foods are. Thank you so much. So we have one more question and then we will um, pop up. The last question we have here, technical question. Do you flip the cake as soon as it leaves the stove? Yes, you have to. Okay. Yeah, it's a must. If you don't, it will just totally cave. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Let's do it. So Again, thank you so much. We're so glad to end this on a sweet note like that. So we will come back together as a full panel and have uh, another conversation kind of about more about Thanksgiving and the meaning behind it. So thanks again, Crystal. Um, <laughs> stay tuned, everyone. If you want to stay on for a little bit longer, we do have another roundtable discussion with all of the panelists this evening. So thank you again so much. So excited to talk to you in just a moment. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, it looks like we have everybody back on. Just want to make sure we just have the one camera on so we're not getting feedback because we've all made that mistake before who anyone who's been on Zoom. <laughs> so hello everybody. I'm so excited, so thankful that everyone was able to um, participate in this this evening. This is very exciting. We are um, excited to have a follow-up conversation right now. Um, we really want to touch on some different things that we had spoken to everyone individually uh, before we you know, came together as a panel. Um, and I want to start with David and Rainbow. So uh, we want to talk about the different roles that food has in community, what you're doing with, you know, we talked a little bit about Sovereign Earthworks. Um, I just want you to kind of like walk me through why it's important to like do the urban gardening, because it looks like in one of the photos that we had, and I think we'll be showing some of these photos. Um, in one of the photos, it looks like you have this beautiful urban garden. So maybe talk to me about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, thank you so much again, Rainbow, pronouns they, them. I think it's important 
for Indigenous sovereignty, especially considering that the majority of Indigenous folks live in an urban environment, um, to kind of bring the the importance of like food right up to people's doorsteps. So many people think when they think of farming or they think of agriculture, or they think of herbs, they think of like these huge production farms, like monoculture production farms. And what we're really trying to do is like grow food for the people, yeah. bring food into people's homes. Um, kind of how we started was um, this idea called, called Queer Kitchen. And so what we would do is like, we'd have this kind of farm to table experience for folks in the community where we'd start in, in the garden um, located here in, in DC, where we would get um, different produce, different um, ingredients and kind of come back to this space, our home um, and cook together. And it would be such an amazing way to engage folks yeah. that, never knew how the importance of food, the importance yeah. of storytelling, the importance of like looking at each other and smiling and eating a meal together and nourishing each other more than just our physical body, but our like mm -hmm. emotional and spiritual bodies. So that's yeah. kind of what, at least for me, you know, Rico, I'd love to hear what you have to say, but for me, it's really just been this amazing, humbling experience to to reconnect with folks and, and to, you know, connect with, with other folks on the panel um, in, in this uh, indigenous food sovereignty movement where we're really trying to, at least for me, not just reclaim stories, but, but create new stories for people in the present. Um, and, and, you know, as a two-spirited, you know, queer gender expansive person, I think it's so important to have like our voices at the table. Um, yeah. So that, that's really what's- Quite literally. What, um, <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. And yeah. did you think that's right? I have nothing else to add. That was perfect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, if just you have any other follow up questions about the work we're doing, like please, yeah. let, you know, feel free to ask in the in the comment section. Um, I'd be happy to share. And and please know that you can like follow us on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Um, yeah, come check us out and check out our stories. We're, we're really excited to be doing this work together. Yeah, and I think it, we could probably share if it's, you know, all right with you, some information and a follow-up email to um, everyone who watched tonight. So we're happy yeah. to share information whenever you're comfortable sharing. We're happy to connect you with, with the viewers. Yeah, thank you so much. We have so many questions that we're not going to be able to get to them all, but that's amazing. It means that people are very excited. Um, yeah, and it's just, it's so cool to see you know, you grow these beautiful plants, these beautiful things, and, you know, it's a cycle. And, you know, one of the amazing photos that we had was of this cornucopia, this, like, beautiful, like, eggplants and squash, yeah. of all these ingredients, and it's just, like, to see it so beautiful, it's, it makes it easier to eat, right? <laughs> and to be growing things that are ancestral. Yeah. You know, like, growing, growing corn, being squashed together, and kind of seeing, it, mm -hmm. it was such a magical experience for us, like, to be growing um, you know, corn, bean, and squash together because we really got to understand their their personality, which I know is so mm -hmm. odd to say, but it was like so extraordinary how like, you know, <laughs> and I'm sure other folks, Linda, I'm sure you know, like how squash just has this protective energy. Such a bully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like we talk about them in these beautiful ways and we're like, oh, sister, squash is like so tall and bean <laughs> is so healthy and squash is so protective. Well, they know Sister Squash, she has like a territorial problem. Yeah. Sister Corn sometimes pulls down Sister Corn. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's so they're like real siblings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Yeah, we um, had a lot of people saying tonight that you should have a cooking show. We should have a gardening show where you talk about the different personalities of all the vegetables. Yeah, it's truly beautiful. And we have like a, a pawpaw tree, which is an indigenous uh, tree that is uh, native to this, this bioregion that has like really just like we had these seeds too. And it was so interesting kind of like how they just kind of fall down and like the the fruit itself kind of almost like returns to the earth but the seeds are still there mm -hmm. and i i found that to be so rewarding to see how like they know there is yeah. a wisdom there that is like kind of driving them and and by them i mean like our plant relatives and um plant ancestors um uh yeah it's 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 
so beautiful. Awesome. Um, all right. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, and I'm going to ask everyone this question, but do you have any resources that you could share for other indigenous native recipes that you know of? And you don't have to think about it right now. We could also follow up later on, but if there's anything that comes off the top of your head. Okay. Elders, connect with your elders, mm -hmm. bring them into the fold, you know, yeah. like you know have have like an intergenerational conversation where you bring the young ones you bring the elders together and and there's these like pool of wisdom that you don't quite know is there but then when you tap into them you're like yo this is such a deep well of knowledge so i would say like for me like you know even even this kind of blue corn recipe is the take on like a recipe that's a family recipe um for my grandmother who is um cooks a lot of like traditional indigenous mexican recipes mm -hmm. um so yeah connect with elders um yeah so one more question that somebody had earlier uh how do you, do you two feel about non-indigenous folks using recipes ingredients etc like does that feel like something you want to celebrate? Does that feel, is there anything that you like, feels weird about that to you? Could you repeat the question one more yeah. time? Yeah, how do you feel about non-Indigenous folks cooking Indigenous recipes, using Indigenous recipes, uh, ingredients, et cetera? I can take that on. Yeah, go. Yeah. I mean, I think it depends on the ingredient. I mean, like, let's be real. Like we're part, you know, like, and not just native folks, but like, you know, Black folks, like Asian folks, Latinx folks, all of our communities have had our recipes stolen. Yeah. Like straight up colonialization was the process by which like European powers used to dominate and subject the world so that they could fill up spice racks and like ingredient pantries. And until we realize that like the modern day, like palette that we've developed is from a history of like centuries of colonialism, like we're going to forget the fact that the food that we eat today is like actually very indigenous and like very global and the fact that we eat things all the time and forget that their ancestors too is part of the problem right mm -hmm. the fact that people see peppers corn squash beans vanilla you know any number of these like really common staple foods cranberries thanksgiving turkey you know like we can keep like moving forward um and see how they've been displaced from their communities yeah. okay these europeans took these plants displaced them from their communities the same tactic they used against human beings and they incorporated them in like larger recipes in the in the pursuit of taste and like in, in the pursuit of taste, art and like whimsy excused genocide, like through flavor. And so that's why like I am like not gonna share, like right now we're kind of, you know, I feel like a lot of indigenous folks are working with plants and animals that are rare, that are endangered, that are like on the verge of extinction. I mean, even look at white sage like what's happening now that it's been like in urban outfitters and etsy and like all these like little like magic craft things is no like like no you don't deserve it like you don't deserve like our riches you never really deserve the riches there's a lot of different european and like very common multicultural global ingredients that you can cook just fine with. Mm -hmm. If you like hear of some really special urban or like any special native ingredient, like maybe it's time to recognize that it might not be for you, you know, and let it exist as itself, as an individual, as a plant, as an animal, right? Don't do it because you respect native people, do it because you respect it because it has a life and it has a spirit and it has ancestors. And then through sh respecting it, through respecting nature, you show respect to indigenous people. Like right that's <laughs> that was, I think that was very well put. Really, thank you so much, David and Rainbow. Um, and this kind of folds into a question that I have for Crystal uh, about foraging. So you obviously really love foraging. You forage a lot. You've got all these beautiful berry foraging photos. Why is that important to you? Um, it's very important. It's the connection. And um, I'm not like a fast forager, not like Linda. <laughs> I, I'm the person that brings a Linda or somebody with me <laughs> because you don't want me to. <laughs> but um, 
<clears throat> to me, it's very important. Like me personally, I do berries. Okay, I keep to what I know and where I what I've known ever since I've been young. And me personally, I like to go by myself, pick berries, talk with the plants, thank Mother Earth, and know where these berries are and where they're going to. And those that's that's my personal thing, and that's something that I always was taught as I was young. Mm -hmm. um, just about, you know, don't take too much, don't take too little and, you know, like on, on that part, but I like to go up into the redwoods. I like to go when I, when I, you know, me personally, it's a personal thing and something where I connect and this is where I'm grateful um, that I got to connect at a very young age when it comes to the blackberries or the huckleberries and elderberries and things like that. So I kind of keep to the berries. <laughs> You don't want me to do mushrooms, <laughs> but I always have it yeah. just when I do, I always have that person that to go with me, but you know, on my personal, um, for me being personal as an indigenous chef, I always go and see how our berries are like this year. We had a really good, awesome, awesome um, time to go get berries. And last year it wasn't. And so that meant that means that we can mean different things. And for me, that meant just leave it be. And yeah. when it's flourishing, go ahead and get some. But all at the same time, I love berries. So I have like freezers, a lot of berries. <laughs> <laughs> but I do share, <laughs> I do share it, you know, that's a number one. But when it comes to that, um, it's a, it's a little personal thing for me. And I love to share, um, what I have to offer. And like, you know, I show my girls how beautiful they are. And I just think they're gorgeous. They're to me, everybody knows me. If everybody knows me, it's better than jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> I just, yeah, it just, to me, it, it just says a lot and it says a lot about um, where I come from, who I am. And I've been really fortunate to be born here on Ohlone land and for me to harvest on Pomo land and the Yurok land. I'm very fortunate and blessed. Well, you know, you actually said something very interesting about your Thanksgiving rituals in the past and where you spent them. So I just hoping that you could share that with our audience today. Oh, um, well, at a very young age, um, you know, my family um, is involved and still involved in the American Indian movement. And we would go in um, sunrise ceremony to Alcatraz. And that's something that I always would cherish the men, um, memories of that. And so of the time, I was probably like seven or eight years old. Um, we went for many, many years until I was like maybe 17. We would go for there for Thanksgiving and we would listen to all these wonderful um, activists and these speakers. Um, when you're young, um, you're just know, you know, you're just going to Alcatraz, you know. <laughs> but at the same time, I was really listening because um, I believe life is a circle, how it came around. Now I speak on Alcatraz. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> what I learned on um, you know what I've learned is about Thanksgiving um it's not it's not so it's you know we all have that we all have that story of how the white man came took the turkey da, 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 and stole the land yeah that's so true but all at the same time for our Thanksgiving as we went to go um, for a sunrise ceremony, we talked about in the forefront what's really going on in Native America. We talk about housing, we talk about health, we talk about our foods. Um, these are the people that I've been very blessed to um, be around and listen, listen to. And my uncle was one and he's the one that started like the sweat lodges in the prisons and you know all these different kind of things and i was taught at a very young age why we don't have a native american restaurant why our foods are not so much in a forefront is there a reason why sometimes i ask that question why because it's so sacred it's so beautiful and especially um our communities it, it to me the reason why I am indigenous chef is because of those Thanksgivings over there. The reason why is because I want other youth, I want our community 
to, what does food sovereignty mean? It's to actually make it accessible into your communities, make it accessible. I want it to be where I wouldn't want, when I was young, I always wondered, I put two and two together at a very young age. And so at the end of the day, I say, yes, that was my journey on Alcatraz of me learning everything and taking it what I know now and put it into the forefront. Such a cool story. And, um, you know, talking about the serenity and ingredients, uh, something that Linda, I think, has a lot of passion around is there's a question and then you can sort of give another answer in addition to this. So Hillary asks, do you think it's appropriate as a non-native to avoid rare or forged ingredients and sub with easily available stuff, but also to use farmed indigenous ingredients from indigenous suppliers to offer that support financially? So Linda, please, like, I just, I know you have lots of ideas about sourcing and all this stuff so take it away <laughs> right so so it, i think it's so important and and it what what david was saying about um indigenous ingredients and colonization is so profound and important because as i you know we were talking about um he was talking about white sage and we were also talking about um bear root or osha earlier and it's so important that you first if you are not indigenous it's so important for you to first leave those ingredients for indigenous people to leave those plants for indigenous people and be, you know, who have known how to harvest those things sustainably for millennia, right? Um, and and that, that isn't to say that, you know, uh, you shouldn't support indigenous vendors, but you will know, you know, obviously indigenous vendors know how to harvest um, these items sustainably, you know? Um, so, so that's a good thing. But there are so many amazing alternatives. And, you know, we, we've actually, so a group of friends and myself have coined this term that we really want to promote with non-Indigenous people, and that is invasivore. So yeah. eat all the invasives, <laughs> you know, they, they, all those things, you know, came here. A lot of them are actually damaging ecosystems. Some of them are amazingly medicinal. Some of them are deliciously edible. Um, like cooking with um, Japanese knotweed, uh, which is a terrible invasive out east and is actually spreading further west. Um, but it's delicious. You can cook it as a dessert. You can cook it savory, um, you know, and that would free up, like if you were cooking with Japanese knotweed, that would free up some indigenous berries for indigenous people. So, um, you know, it's, it's I think, um, a really considerate thing to do. But again, you know, um, there are, I know a lot of Ojibwe's who would really love for you to support them by purchasing wild rice from them because they harvest that rice in a really good way. Um, and then they use the funds that they get from that to support their families and their communities. So, you know, there are um, certainly ingredients. Just make sure you're informed about what you're eating. Make sure that, um, you know, you've, you've talked to people, talk to indigenous people. Um, all around you and, and ask them. We had another question earlier too for you about uh, your drying meat, which seems like that's a very low barrier, easy thing for a lot of folks to do using mm. the traditional method, but you know, you can use lots of different products. How how does it work without salt or smoking? Like how, how does it preserve? Um, yeah. So that is, it, it is so crazy. It's like people have these blind, it's, you know, we do because we have been taught to fear food that, you know, to fear independence, food sovereignty. We have been taught to fear that. Think about the term wild and the connotation that wild has, right? Um, I can't tell you, I, I've done so many plant walks in which I've gone up to apple trees or crab apple trees, picked one off and taken a bite and had people gasp because they thought wild apples were poisonous. No lie, you know? And, and I mean, it's just, it's, it's so hard, you know, as someone who tries to promote food sovereignty and tries to promote um, knowing and understanding your food, it's so hard to see that. And it's the same way with drying meat. There is like this huge wall that people have where they, you know, they've been told if you leave meat out too long, it is going to spoil, <laughs> right? You know, and, and they can't get past that. Unless, of course, you preserve it with salt or unless you preserve it with smoke from a fire. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessary. L literally, all we did was we took like, you know, we had some deer back straps, for example, and we cut them very thinly. It doesn't matter if you go with the grain or against the grain. That's personal preference. We just cut it very thinly and then we hang it up in sheets on this rack right here in our dining room. <laughs> um, if it's a really humid time of year, we'll put a fan on it. 
Mm-hmm. But like right now, it's super dry outside here in the Dakotas. And so we don't even do that. We literally just hung the meat up there. Can you pass me a piece of that? Do you need so, so we literally just hung it up there and um, it's been hanging for a couple of days and it's so dry that it, you know, it falls apart. Right. And, and you can do, <laughs> oh, I know you can eat it just like this. Dried meat is delicious. We have forgotten what our food tastes like because everything we eat has to be either sweet or salty in our heads. Um, we've forgotten what things taste like. So, you know, we just, we eat dried meat just like this. Um, if you want to season it, you can, but because we use dried meat in soups, we use it um, to make wasna, which is also known as pemmican. So it's like balls of dried meat mixed with fat and berries, delicious snack, the world's perfect food. Um, <laughs> you know, because we do that, we don't like to season it. Um, so so I just, I just re- really want to reiterate this you can hang meat up to air dry as long as it's sliced very thinly and you're going to be fine. If it's humid, put a fan on it. No big. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to ask you one more question. We're getting close to the end here, but uh, also asking you, do you, is there like uh, an aggregate list of sources or do you have any sources for indigenous ingredients to, to find them? Absolutely. And um, uh, everyone on this call knows Andy Murphy. She does the Toasted Sister podcast. It's a fantastic podcast. She's actually been putting a fantastic list of indigenous vendors together. Um, And so uh, we'll make sure to post that so that everyone can have access to it. There's just too many to name. And and you know how it is with indigenous people. If I tell you one person where to get wild rice, my five other vendors are going to be super pissed off at me. So um, (laughs) so I'm not going to name any names right now <laughs> that is totally fair um and so crystal i you know do you have any particular sources or are we just going to go ahead and go with andy murphy i think maybe that's the safest for us to do let's maybe not yeah. she's putting a whole list together okay. <laughs> andy <laughs> she was on the uh she was hosting our last indigenous event so she's, she's a friend um yes. So yeah, I just I do want to just thank everybody again for joining our call. Thank every all the panelists for taking so much you know time and energy and love putting that into this event this evening. Um, just excited to kind of this time of year. You know, it's a pretty intense time for a lot of people, and I think this particular year has been more intense for a lot of people. So this is like for me, it's just a wonderful escape. It's a wonderful way to reconnect with the food of our lands and just kind of like take a minute to think about things. Um, I also will say for the folks who did not get the food box, like we said, um, you know, hit a MOFAD about that. Uh, They will help you out with that. Um, And we're also gonna be following up with some more resources and, um, you know, links to this event as well that we have recorded. So, you know, when you do get your box, you can cook along and maybe take your time, pause, go back and all that sort of stuff. Um, And I also do want to one more time, just call out, that there is another event in December with Noche Buena, a celebration of Filipina ex Christmas traditions. Um, the date's not on here, but I believe they said the 16th and you can just double check at the greenspace.org uh, or mofad.org for more information. Uh, there's gonna be delicious pan seat recipes and more. So it's another really cool event um, centering around you know, native voices. So we're super excited about that one coming up. And again, thank you so much everyone for joining tonight. And hopefully we'll do more of these in the future. I hope that some of you do get a cooking show. Some of you panelists do. That would be awesome. <laughs> so, again, thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Ah, you too. Thanks, guys. It was nice Love you all. You guys. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.